This week's Torah portion includes a compendium of civil laws, including one of the most famous passages in the Torah, an eye for an eye, recognizable across different religions and cultures. And we know what the Torah means. It means that if you damage someone's eye, you blind them, you have to pay them the value of an eye. You don't get your own eye gouged out. It's remarkable to me as a plaintiff's personal injury attorney just how much of our civil litigation law in America and in other countries is based on the Torah's laws. It's equally remarkable how much the Torah's laws differ, but in large part, they're the same. For example, we get to argue to juries, no juries in the Torah, but there are juries in America, and tell the jury, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, no amount of money could give my client back his eye, could give him back his sight, could make up for the harm that the defendant did to him. But ladies and gentlemen of the jury, money is all that we have. It's the only method that our legal system recognizes for you to compensate my client. And so it's all well and good. We know that an eye for an eye is about money. But why, if God meant money, didn't he say so? He could have said the value of an eye for an eye, but he didn't. Why not? Maybe because he's trying to send us the message, if you're negligent, if you're reckless, and you knock someone's eye out, you know what? You really deserve to lose your own eye. I'm going to let you get away by paying money, but rest assured, really, morally, your own eye was forfeit. And when he sends that message, he wants us to be more careful so that people don't lose eyes and limbs, like the old joke, it's only funny until someone loses an eye. I attended the Kosher Food and Wine Exposition in Manhattan earlier this evening. And like many other people, I was very careful to make arrangements to have someone drive me home afterwards because I knew that I was going to be drinking wine. At this event, they have all of the high-end restaurants and wine manufacturers there. It's an event that, frankly, would make Caligula or Achashverosh blush. And I thought about how careful I was not to drink and drive, something that I'd never do, and none of my friends would ever do. But I also thought about how many of us are so careful not to ever drink and drive, and yet we're so careless when it comes to driving while otherwise impaired. Studies have shown that if you drive while texting, you're about four times more impaired than if you drive while drinking or after drinking. And that makes sense, because the drunk fellow may be zigging and zagging and weaving, but at least he's looking at the roadway. The fellow or the woman who's texting is not. I tell this to my friends, and one of my friends once said to me, are you kidding, texting? I read the New York Times while I'm driving. He was so proud. You know, that's all well and good. Until somebody like that, God forbid, becomes one of my clients, a victim of catastrophic injury. I'm the guy who spends his days at work sitting at his desk looking at autopsy photos because somebody got killed because some knucklehead was texting. I tell my older children when they're ready to drive that, and their friends, that every car manufacturer has an obligation to create a special receptacle for cell phones for teenage drivers. And they say to me, really? And I say, really? It's called the trunk because we know teenagers are anatomically, biologically incapable of not responding to a text when it comes in. And so many adults are as well. It's not just teenagers that ought to keep their cell phones in the trunk. So let's do ourselves a favor. Those mothers who are texting with their kids in the car, husbands with their wives in the car, people with their parents in the car, people driving alone with other people on the roadway. Let's stop endangering ourselves. Let's stop endangering our family members. Let's stop endangering other people on the roadway. Drive safely.